Burnside. And I want to welcome this month's Population Health Spotlight. Louder! Okay, <laughs> now I can do it. Every year, Burnside students are asked to nominate a public health leader they want to hear speak. I have the pleasure of nominating Dr. Dr. Ingrid Binswanger, and the Student Selection Committee chose her from a large group of nominees. Ingrid A. Bitswinger, MD, MPH, MS, is a senior investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and an associate professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, where she directs the Primary Care Research Fellowship. Dr. Binswanger's research focuses on novel approaches to enhance opioid safety and prevent deaths from overdose in clinical and community settings. She has also conducted extensive research on the health of people with criminal justice involvement. I'm still having trouble hearing you in the back. Okay. Sorry. She is focused on understanding and addressing the high risk of death among people transitioning from prison back to the community. Dr. Binswanger's research has been funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Department of Justice, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She currently serves as an associate editor for SAJ and the assistant editor for addiction. She treats patients with addiction at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado. Thank you, Dr. Binswanger, for, for, for visiting Burnside and sharing your research. And a friendly re reminder that students are invited to a student roundtable with the speaker in Connolly Collaboratory immediately following the lecture. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right, so it sounds like I have to speak loudly, is that right? <laughs> How's this? Is it okay in terms of, you guys will let me know if it's not loud enough. I don't think the mic is working in here, right? It doesn't project to the room. Okay, okay. All right, well, I don't have any disclosures, no pharmaceutical money that's supporting this research. Um, I do get funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse for this work. So what I thought I'd do today is, um, sort of walk you through the current state of the opioid epidemic. Many of the, much of this information you're probably already aware of. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of overdose, and in the process I'll bring up some sort of notes of caution based on overdose in populations with criminal justice involvement, which is sort of the focus of the research that I did earlier on in my career. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned trying to translate some programs that are more commonly providing overdose education and naloxone in community-based settings into large health systems to sort of talk about how we're trying to translate community-based effective interventions into health systems to address this epidemic. And I'll talk about some future directions for the work in that area. Um, if anything's unclear, please stop me and ask me um, if it's not clear. And we'll hopefully have a little bit of time for discussion at the end, and if not, in the round table. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what opioids are, but I thought I'd just point out that these are generic names for opioids, codone, codeine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, <coughs> methadone, and heroin. These are all opioids. Um, they're either synthetic, semi-synthetic, or naturally occurring opioids derived from the poppy. Um, there's a bunch of brand names that are also used to refer to these medications. They're mostly Schedule three as far as DEA, I mean, Schedule two as far as DEA schedule, which means that they're considered to have high abuse potential, with the exception of heroin that has no medical use. Um, so it's considered Schedule one. But heroin, just like all of the other opioids, is an opioid. Um, it's not that much different, except that it's very short acting, which is why people feel like it has a very strong abuse potential and it has a different classification. So many of you have probably already seen this figure before. This is national overdose death rates from prescription opioid pain relievers. Um, that's been increasing actually substantially more since the late 1990s. And I was really a medical resident uh, during the sort of the start of this epidemic. And at that time, you know, as physicians, we were really taught pain has to be treated and opioids are effective. Um, it's okay to treat people with pain with chronic opioid therapy. Oxycontin was being pretty aggressively marketed to physicians. And um, we were taught pain should be considered the fifth vital sign. So everybody needs to be assessed, both in inpatient and outpatient settings for pain, and it treated. Um, and also that there was very little risk of addiction with pain treatment. 
um, that if the person had pain, it somehow, I think the mythology of when I was on the wards was sort of, it sort of absorbs up the opioid in a way that doesn't lead to addiction. So that was sort of how we were treated. So that's part of the context of how this happened. Um, then in, unfortunately, very recently, we've seen tremendous increases in heroin overdoses. And some of these very recently have also involved fentanyl, which is a contaminant, which is typically um, put in with the heroin. And frequently, people don't, aren't fully aware that they've necessarily um, been exposed to fentanyl, although some people intentionally do seek it. Um, and fentanyl is substantially more, fe more powerful, so that's also why we've been seeing some increases, substantial increases in overdose. So this is sort of the scary picture. I think, you know, here we sort of started, have started to see some stabilization of rates of prescription opioid overdoses, although they're still extremely high, um, and they're definitely not coming down. But I think the rate of increase of heroin overdose is what is causing a lot of alarm around the country. So there's a number of preventive interventions, and this is really just a short list of preventive interventions that people are trying either at the state level, at the individual patient provider level, or at the sort of national level. And some of them, the things are really better divided sort of into primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, because obviously everyone who uses opioids is not the same, and they have very different stages of involvement with the medication or the drug. Some overdoses are true adverse, unintentional overdoses that occur in people who are otherwise opioid naive and may just be exposed to sort of a too high a potency or a long-acting opioid in the course of routine clinical care. And then others, of course, occur in people who have very significant opioid use disorders um, and are um, ingesting very large or taking in very large amounts of opioids or heroin. So a lot of efforts in our state and Colorado have really focused on that initial exposure and trying to sort of clamp down on prescribing. And I think that that's a very sort of compelling and intuitive approach, although it could have some potentially unintended effects. But so people that I work with are working on how to prevent excessive opioid prescribing at the time of hospital discharge or at the time of after surgery, just, you know, give people just two or three days worth instead of 30 days. And that's been a very active area of policy and um, health care efforts in this area. Other approaches are to, say, promote safe disposal or safe home storage of opioids so that children are not exposed to opioids or young people don't steal them from their parents' uh, cabinets, medicine cabinets. For people who've developed opioid use disorders, people are focused on trying to figure out how to get them into evidence-based treatment. Evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder is clearly either buprenorphine or methadone supported, um, as well as behavioral treatments. And then other people are focusing on preventing death, so basically tertiary prevention. You know, how to educate people how to identify and how to respond to an overdose before, say, the paramedics get there and how to deliver naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist, which I'll talk a lot more about as we proceed. There are other efforts also being made, such as safe injection facilities. I'd sort of put that in the tertiary prevention um, strategies and community-based approaches to try to address this problem as well. So naloxone is an effective opioid antidote. It's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration since 1971 to be delivered by intramuscular or intravenous routes. It's commonly traditionally been used by hospital per personnel or by paramedics. So it's less traditionally been used in sort of community-based settings or in home settings um, until really the 1990s when that started. Um, it reverses all signs of opioid intoxication and in particular the respiratory depression that's associated with too many opioids. Um, it takes about two minutes up to maybe eight minutes to act, and it usually lasts for only about 20 to 90 minutes, so some people need repeated doses of naloxone. It's not known to have any abuse potential, and in fact, most people sort of hate to be Narcan. Um, that's the brand name for it, because they go into withdrawal if they're opioid dependent and they receive naloxone. Um, they can go into withdrawal, especially with higher doses of naloxone. So in the 1990s, um, community-based overdose education and naloxone programs were sort of started to be developed by sort of small 
harm reduction agencies working in the community. They've reported that more than 150,000 people were trained and dispensed up through 2014, and it's much greater since then. More than 26,000 reversals have been reported. Um, it's been shown to be cost effective as an intervention for people who use heroin. It's also been associated in Massachusetts with some, in ecologic analyses, with some improved community level overdose yeah. outcomes. And um, it's also shown to be work based on the work of one of your experts here um, to really result in increased confidence and positive social roles for trained responders. So um, this is sort of a picture of intramuscular naloxone that's commonly distributed by these agencies. It's a little, it's simpler for people who say use heroin to use these intramuscular um, injection kits because they're already familiar with how to inject. Um, so putting it together and you know drawing up the fluid and all that stuff is much simpler for people who use heroin. It's more of an issue for people who use pharmaceutical opioids for pain because they're just not familiar with how to draw up an injection. Um, it's just not something that they commonly do unless they have diabetes. This is an intranasal kit. This is not FDA approved, but it's also used by some of these harm reduction action, harm reduction um, organizations. And uh, it is even more complicated to use because there's three pieces you have to put together. And most of the physicians I know actually don't know how to do this mm -hmm. and find it pretty difficult. It's not intuitive. It requires a fair amount of training. So it's not a great uh, tool for people who um, don't do this frequently, who may only have one exposure to this kind of event. This is an intramuscular uh, auto-injector. Like, auto um, it actually speaks to you. It's called Evzio. It tells you to call 911 and to deliver the dose. The problem with this is that it's upwards of $700, if not into the thousands of dollars for um, a pack. So this is a very expensive device. It is simple to use. But it's very expensive, and I'd say I don't know. I don't personally know any health systems that has this on their formulary for patients. So because it's so expensive, it's just not. It's not being taken up by most insurance plans that I know of, um, in my area, in any case. This is the new Narcan um, nasal spray, and this one is also very easy to use. It's a single device. It's sort of like giving somebody Flonase in the nose. Um, that works a lot is probably easier, although it's pretty easy to hit the button to spray it all out before you actually have to use it. So that's one thing that people have to be cautioned on. But most people sort of know how to put a spray in somebody's nose. So this is sort of a promising new device. And its price point is still pretty high. It's about $150 right now. Um, but it's, and it probably will continue to go up in price. But it's a uh, more affordable type of device for healthcare systems. So before I talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done on this, I just want to talk about the settings that I currently do research on. I've done a, a fair amount of work related to criminal justice involvement in health, but most of the focus of this talk is really going to be around opioid overdose prevention. Um, and currently, I work at Kaiser Permanente Colorado, and I don't think you have Kaiser here. So this is basically an integrated managed care program. It's a little different than most delivery systems in that the delivery system and the insurance company are merged. So the incentives are well aligned to sort of provide preventive care and save money. So it's a little bit different than sort of traditional fee-for-service medicine where there may not be an incentive to provide preventive care. So it's, it provides an opportunity to really do sort of innovative and neat prevention-oriented programs. Um, it serves more than uh, 680,000 members in the state of Colorado. Um, the population served is very similar to the state of Colorado's population demographically. We also work in Denver Health, where I was provided primary care um, for eight years. This is a safety net delivery system. It's urban. Um, it's got a trauma center. It Probably half of the children born in uh, Denver are born at this hospital. There's a linked network of federally qualified health centers associated with it, about 10 of them. And it serves more than 90,000 patients a year in primary care. And it has a very large population of Medicaid patients. So between these two settings, we have a very diverse population that we've tried to do some of this research in. And it's been instructive in terms of some lessons learned. So 
what we've been focused on for the last probably four or five years is trying to figure out how to bring naloxone into these clinical settings. Um, the reason is that we, in these clinical settings, we serve you know, hundreds of thousands of patients. It's a large population, many thousands of patients who are on chronic pharmaceutical opioids. I'd say at Kaiser alone, at this given time, we maybe have 10, at least 10,000 patients on substantial doses of chronic opioids, and it's more, at, or many at Denver Health as well. Um, so together, we have probably around 30,000 patients that can be touched um, at a given point in time. And so these primary care clinics at these two health systems really offer the chance to touch many patients at potential risk for pharmaceutical and heroin opioid overdose. However, we really don't know how in all those patients to figure out who it is that needs naloxone or needs an in intervention. What the harm reduction action type of organizations do is they typically do one-on-one -on -one training with people. In fact, in Denver, they actually bring people who use heroin in for a whole hour-long training. Some of them can abbreviate these, but this is not realistic for a clinical, large clinical samples in health systems. Um, and then we also don't really know how providers and patients would feel about this intervention. And there's a lot of concerns about both provider perspectives and patient perspectives, and I'll tell you more about that work. So we know from the epidemiologic research that there's a lot of medication features and prescribing practices that are associated with opioid overdose. This includes increasing opioid dose, and this is where a ton of attention has been focused on sort of clamping down on the dose. One of the epidemiologic studies by Dunn um, and colleagues showed that if you're on a dose of more than 100 milligrams morphine equivalents per day versus 1 to 19, your hazard ratio for an overdose is almost ninefold higher. So that's a pretty substantial risk factor for an overdose is high dose. Also, long-acting and extended release formulations, because they tend to stay in your body longer, it's a little bit harder to titrate the dose so to, the, to, the, um, to avoid over-sedation. Those are also risks. Polypharmacy, combining opioids with benzodiazepines or other medications for anxiety um, can also be associated with over overdose. And there's been a lot of emphasis on opioids that's prescribed by multiple clinicians. And a big push to address that is the prescription drug monitoring programs where doctors can sort of look up who's been prescribed what and try to limit maybe the number of opioid prescriptions people are getting. So those are some of the um, findings related to pharmaceutical opioid overdose. Based on these observational data, none of these are from trials, but are really observational, um, there's been all of these local, state, and national policies that have been implemented, and I'm sure that some, I know some of these are happening here as well. Um, so these prescription drug monitoring programs, which I assume you have one in Pennsylvania because almost every state does. Um, in fact, they're mandating in Colorado that every physician is, is, uh, is registered with the prescription drug monitoring program. There have been new CDC guidelines about prescribing opiates for chronic pain. There have been many changes in insurance government coverage and formulary requirements to try to clamp down on prescribing. Um, and then there's quality metrics that are being proposed um, to also take, try to restrict prescribing. So just as an example, in our health system over the last three years, this is just, actually this is a partial list of all of the things we've tried to do to address this epidemic within our health system. Um, we've tried to implement short-acting pill quantity limits of 120 per month. We implemented an opioid registry to try to follow people on opioids. We, there were a lot of efforts to try to get people to do urine toxicology screening on every patient prescribed opioids, to get them to sign narcotic use agreements. Um, dose has been covered, coverage has been limited. There's been a lot of physician education about the new CDC guidelines. And then now there's new quality metrics that are tied to reimbursement that um, relate to the number of plan members who have high-dose opioids. So there's been a ton of different things that have been done. And this is some of sort of the results of some of that work, I'd say. This is tracking um, both crude percentages and age-adjusted percentages of patients of members prescribed chronic opioids in Kaiser, Colorado. And you can see it's 
pretty hard to move. I mean, it's basically been relatively stable, slightly increasing, and then there's been a slight decrease after some of these policies, more recently after some of these policies were implemented. But it's a hard, it's hard to move this despite all of these concerted efforts within the system. What's been interesting is that well, what we actually saw was that there's actually been a lot more reduction in acute opioid prescriptions. So not the people who take them every day for pain, but the people who, say, have had an injury or surgery or their backs out, um, that that actually has, or cancer treatment, you know, those prescriptions of acute opioids, that has been reducing. So I think it's a little easier to sort of move acute opioid prescribing than chronic, but that's at least what we've observed. And that's not actually the intended effect of these policies. These, effect, these policies were really designed to address chronic opioid prescribing. Um, and this is a potentially excellent because it could reduce the exposure. It's also potentially harmful because some of these patients may actually really need acute, I mean, Opioids are very good for acute pain, and that's an appropriate use of opioid treatment. So some of these patients may actually need this treatment and may have restricted access. Both of the slides show a sharp, sharp curve downwards starting in January 2016. Something happened in January 2016? Yeah, you know, there's not any particular thing that happened except that that is when we sort of get new members. So there's typically sort of a shift in the population, so it's probably... I think that that's more of a, a reflection of maybe the population changing slightly. It's possible. I'm not sure. So, um, so one of the things that we did was to try to predict who was at risk for an opioid overdose so that we could then target the naloxone to those patients most at risk. And so we developed a predictive model that basically looks forward um, from a single, so if you're a provider that basically tries to model, if you're a provider seeing a patient in an office on that day, based on their risk factors that day, what's their two-year risk for overdose? And the reason we chose two years is because naloxone has a shelf life about two years. So presumably if you prescribe naloxone today, your patient should still have it in their household for about two years before it expires. So um, this was one of the slides sort of looking at some of the um, predictors of, this is one of the predictors, which is dose of an opioid overdose. And what we found is a similar, somewhat similar, although a little different trend as the epidemiologic data in that, at least in our safety net health system, dose, high dose therapy did appear to be associated with two-year risk of an overdose, although it wasn't quite as clean as the observational, other observational data we've seen in the past. Unfortunately, then we tried to validate this predictive model at Kaiser, and we're still working on that. But one of the things we found is that our relationship at Kaiser is totally different with dose. In fact, very high dose, the people in the highest dose quintiles actually have a lower risk of two-year overdose than people in the middle range. So um, this sort of threw a wrench into some of our plans in that it's not so easy to use dose as sort of a crude distinguisher of who is at risk and who's not at risk. It seems that there's a lot of other factors involved, such as history of substance use disorders, psychiatric disorders, tobacco use appears to be a risk factor, heroin use, opioid by injection, prior overdose, all of these other things that have been seen in the literature that seem to be associated. So dose itself is not sort of adequate to target an intervention, at least in our population. So... The other complicating so it's any so the other complicating fact is that um, from the prior work that I'd done, you know, we really learned that there's some other factors such as the setting you're in, where you are physically, and also what kinds of transitions of care you're experiencing that might that are also very influential. These are more time varying types of risks, um, and so for example, we found that. Release from prison is a big major risk factor for overdose. Discharge among opioid dependent people, discharge from the hospitalization is they're at high risk. Discharge from treatment, so people coming out of detox are at high risk. Um, beginning opioid treatment, so starting methadone or starting buprenorphine is a high risk time. Coming off of treatment is a high risk time. So there's all these other sort of time varying factors that are. Um, highly associated with overdose, and that's because the potency 
of opioids is very variable, and there's a lot of tolerance effects. Um, so people get used to the dose they're on. And when you start mucking around with the tolerance and the potency, then bad things can happen. And so this is an example. You know, when people are incarcerated, there is some exposure to opioids in the facilities, but not a lot. And so they tend to be relative, they basically undergo forced abstinence um, because they don't get treatment. Typically, they don't get treatment with buprenorphine or methadone, except in unusual cases like pregnancy. Um, so when people get out, they're re-exposed to whatever triggered them. They might not have had substance use treatment, and they relapse very quickly. And then there's a very high risk of death during that um, early post-release period. So based on data from Washington State, with over 76,000 people released from prison, we found a very high rate of death in the first week after release that sort of then went down somewhat, but still was always elevated substantially compared to the general population. And then we compared this with non-overdose deaths to see if it was different. And coming out of prison is associated with a threefold, or more than threefold risk of dying compared to the general population, especially even if you adjust for age, gender, and race. But it doesn't have the same dramatic time trends when it's not overdose as the cause of death. So people are at risk for cardiovascular disease and homicide and suicide and other kinds of issues after release from prison, but it doesn't have the same dramatic time trend as overdose because of these potency effects, the pharmaceutical, pharmacologic effects of opioids. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I'll just say about dose, because there has been so much emphasis on restricting access to opioids, is that there are concerns, there are a lot of concerns about heroin, uh, you know, transition, people transitioning from pills to heroin because heroin's less expensive. In many places, it's easier to get than um, pills. And among people who use heroin, many of them started with um, opioid pain relievers, and many of them have been dependent on opioid pain relievers. And so, but what we don't really know is how many people who are actually prescribed, we don't have sort of the natural history in terms of in a population that has been prescribed opioids, how many of them are going to end up taking heroin. That's the one thing we're not totally sure. And what does these restrictive policies potentially do to that risk? Um, so we're not really sure what the drivers are to heroin in terms of that, in terms of people who are prescribed opioids for chronic pain. And then I guess I'll just bring up one other point is that it can be very hard as a primary care provider to take care of patients who have chronic pain because you feel sort of useless um, because we don't have that many great interventions for pain. And many of the interventions we do have uh, require a substantial uh, amount of resources and are not necessarily covered by insurance. So um, there is a temptation, I think, to some extent among some primary care providers that if their patients do develop aberrant opioid use behaviors, not to try to engage them in care, but actually to try to fire them or to try to sort of get them out of their practices and to also not accept patients who have risk factors or aberrant opioid. And some practices even say, we won't take anyone if you're on a chronic opioid, you can't join our practice. But this is obviously very concerning because this is the population that we most need to treat um, because the risk of death from untreated opioid use disorder is extraordinarily high. And in a systematic review of 58 international studies, the all-cause crude mortality rate is 2.1 per 100 person years, which is just, I mean, unbelievably high, probably higher than most many cancers. If you take a 19-year-old woman who is injecting heroin, I'd like to think about like all that we do if she got a lymphoma, which often is curable, and the bone marrow transplants and all of the kinds of interventions we would do, but you take a woman who's 19 and has a heroin use disorder, they get very little in terms of resources to try to save their lives, even though their mortality rate is 2% per year. So, um, so there's a major disparity in sort of how we treat different conditions, especially opioid use disorder. Um, so, and then the standardized mortality ratio compared to the general population is 14, almost 15 times higher. So the mortality in this population is just um, astoundingly high. 
and it's a very sad for me that some people are getting fired from their practices <laughs> um, for developing signs of an opioid use disorder when their risk of death is so high. So, <clears throat> any questions just on any of the factual stuff? Yes. Um, you know, I th if I recall correctly, I think the CDC guidelines do, <coughs> I think they're like number nine. I, they have like, I forget how many, it's like nine or 12. I think one of them is about sort of the need to get people with opioid use disorders into treatment um, and appropriate referrals. And I'm certain that the people who wrote the guidelines would not endorse sort of, you know, um, sort of a efforts to disengage the patient. So I think the CDC guidelines did sort of incorporate the need for engagement into substance use disorder. And they did, as far as I recall, they do also talk about um, uh, the need for evidence-based pharmacologically supported treatment. So, yes? Just a quick comment in a way. I'm a member of the American Academy of Pain Medicine. And yeah. These are the people who actually are largely responsible for treating the people with chronic pain. And you mentioned, and I, I just want to make two points. One, the really big difficulty we have in separating out people who have chronic pain who are under care and who really need the medications. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's happening, of course, with the opioid epidemic is that they're getting less and less able to get what they need. Um, and I know that Kaiser, you couldn't look at that and see who the primary care docs patients were who were really legitimate chronic pain patients. Um, and secondly, that most of the people who are chronic pain patients who again are legitimately treating their pain, aren't really, they're not the opioid abusers. Mm -hmm. Most of them are being asked to and sign uh, contracts with their physicians, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. manage things pretty well, and a lot of them, where they can, will be asked to try to get off of the opioids as soon as the chronic pain mm -hmm. diminishes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's real important for us in public health to keep in mind that we really have a couple very different populations who are being lumped into this opioid epidemic yeah. I, issue. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a, there are, that's one of the issues that I think we've learned about in some of our predictive modeling. The outcome is very complicated, and there's different pathways to that outcome. Um, so I think there's a lot of different pathways. I'd be a little bit, I'm a little bit cautious about the use of legitimate pain because it makes it seem like, there are people who are illegitimate. I think it's a little complicated when we start to get into the language of how we refer to people with opioid use disorders versus legitimate pain patients. So I try to avoid that dichotomy just because I think it may enhance some of the stigma that people with opioid use disorders develop. And I'd say in my addiction practice, I have a tremendous number of patients who started with pain, major motor vehicle accidents, major burns in the intensive care unit for months and over time developed opioid use disorders and over time switched to heroin. And you couldn't have predicted that those sort of patients in advance were going to have the bad outcome. So I think that that, so it's a little bit tricky to disentangle that, but, but I, appreciate, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. So in terms of, um, so going back to sort of the original question, which is who do we target for naloxone in a large health system? You know, some of the decisions that we've made in our system is um, that patients with known opioid use disorder should all be prescribed naloxone. And so now in our addiction treatment center, anyone who comes in with an opioid use disorder gets, is given naloxone. And the nurse does the training one-on-one -on -one with those patients um, because they're at very high risk. Interestingly, a lot of them will decline it because they feel like they're not at risk because they're in treatment. Um, but we do try to offer it to all of those patients. We have decided that identifying patients at risk based on their opioid dose alone is going to miss important risk groups, so we're trying not to restrict our opioid, our naloxone prescribing to those patients because we're worried that that's missing other people who might die. Um, so we've sort of opted to use more universal and broad approaches, such as dispensing naloxone under a standing order where anyone can walk in and get a dose of naloxone from the pharmacy. 
Um, but in terms of our active outreach to get naloxone into people's hands, we've been also trying to balance the cost of this $150 medication um, with thousands of patients who might benefit, um, and also the opportunity costs of what it entails to advise people on this in primary care, um, because what other screening are they not doing when they're spending all the time on naloxone? Uh, what other advising on diabetes or hypertension are they not giving? And then we've also been aware that in a population of patients with diabetes and hypertension, cardiovascular disease, there are some potential risks associated with naloxone in that if the person's actually having a cardiac arrest instead of an overdose, you may be wasting time with the naloxone instead of doing CPR. So there are some potential harms. They're low. They're not very risky, but we have to take those into account. So now I'll move a little bit into sort of the implementation of this program, and I'll talk about how providers and patients talk about this emerging practice in our health systems. So we did some qualitative research where we did sort of t research with both providers, met primary care medical staff, actually not just providers, also nurses, pharmacists, other people, clerks, other people in the clinics, and patients taking high-dose opioids for pain. And our effort was to try to really find out what are the barriers and what are the facilitators of this practice. So um, this was, there were 10 one-hour qualitative focus groups with medical staff at three different, um, in three different health systems, University, the Safety Net, and Kaiser, and 22 individual interviews. This is not very qualitative, but we randomly selected the patients. So that was, that's probably not, not what we usually do in qualitative research, but we randomly selected patients who received high-dose opioid therapy based on electronic health records. Um, and we had the interviews done by an anthropologist and a doctoral student. I'll just note that this was not by a physician, which I think really, really changed the conversation. And I feel like the patients were much more open with our non-physician interviewers. I think it would have been very different if they'd done the interviews with me. Um, and our interview guides were based on the theory of planned behavior and the health belief not model. So these are the kinds of questions that we ask based on the theory. You know, what do you know about naloxone? Who do you think is at risk for, nalox for overdose? What benefits and risks do you see in prescribing this to your patients? Um, and how could we address some of these barriers? So we had themes that emerged in five constructs. There were some pretty significant knowledge gaps. There was some diversity in who people thought should be targeted and also in patients' own perceived risk of an overdose. Um, there were some um, perceptions about benefits of overdose education naloxone in the clinical setting, barriers, and some facilitators. So I'm going to walk through the provider and the patient perspectives for each of these constructs, one after the other. Hopefully that won't be confusing. Um, so, But let me just try to see if I can make a coherent story out of this. Um, so. The providers had very little knowledge. Th these interviews were done just as context between 2013 and 14. So it's already been a few years, and I think this is changing. But at that point, there was almost no knowledge among providers about naloxone for bystander use. So all of this work that's been done in, in community-based settings n never got to the providers. <laughs> the providers didn't know about this. They didn't know that this was a practice that had been going on since the 1990s. Um, and they really only remembered naloxone from their medical school experience or its use in the hospital, which is very different than using it at home or in a setting where somebody's having an overdose on the street. They got very confused about suboxone, naloxone, and naltrexone. These suboxone has naloxone in there just as a diversion control mechanism because it's not absorbed through the sublingual route. Um, and naltrexone is used for alcohol and opioid use disorder, but the medications sound very similar, which confused providers, not surprisingly. Um, and there were a lot of concerns about adverse events in their patient populations. And I already alluded to, you know, if a patient's at risk for cardiac arrest and an opioid overdose, how do you know what the event is that has led them to be unconscious in front of you? And so as a consequence, there was very little prescribing even when the medication was available. So one provider said, I probably just don't have quite as much knowledge about the outpatient safety of it to feel comfortable prescribing it right now. So everybody knew that the drug itself is effective. It works. It reverses an overdose. But they don't know about how effective it is when used by a bystander in the outpatient setting. 
And so that was their concern, was is it, is it okay to use it that way? Then patients said that they really had had very few prior discussions about their overdose risk with the providers who prescribed them opioids. This is very interesting because these are all patients who met our definition for chronic opioid use, disor chronic, not disorder, chronic opioid use and were on very high doses of opioids. And yet most of them could not recall having any discussion with their providers about overdose. <clears throat> A lot of them reported that their past opioid risk behaviors, the way they took their opioid medications in risky ways was linked to the fact that they didn't know that that was risky um, or they hadn't had experience um, with, with problems with it. So, it. so they didn't realize that it was risky. Some of them knew that naloxone was used for heroin, um, but they generally had never heard about its use for patients prescribed opioids. And some of them actually really don't know what an overdose means. The actual technical meaning of what is an overdose, most people thought that means that you've taken too much of the drug. They didn't even really know what it was, um, and they didn't necessarily understand that it could be truly unintentional um, <clears throat> or an adverse effect of the drug. So there's not too much education about it, overdose. When I first started taking it, no one told me about OD or anything about that. You know what I mean? Because I was not taking, I was taking it not as prescribed. I was just like, when I felt pain, I would just take like five or six of them or whatever. Then in the end, I'd run out. So this person didn't have a clear understanding of how to take the pet medications and how to follow the instructions and didn't know that overdose was a risk from that behavior. Another patient said, well, I think that what puts people at risk for any problematic medication situations is a lack of education. So education was a big issue. Um, Another patient said, I think they, meaning doctors, assume that we're stupid. I think they make the assumption that we're not going to get it even if we're told it, you know, the truth, the side effects, whatever. And then their caregiver who was in the room with them said, and they assume someone else already told you, that a nurse told you or a pharmacist told you. So basically these people felt, some of the patients felt like physicians didn't take the responsibility of educating their patients well and that they passed the buck to other members of the healthcare team. Um, so that there was a real disconnect. Um, in terms of target groups, the medical staff had a whole list of the types of people that, or risk groups that they thought should be prescribed naloxone. Some of these can be easily identified in the electronic health record, but some of these are a little bit harder to get your arms around, like impulsivity or poorly controlled pain. Um, and then other physicians thought even household members should be prescribed naloxone. And that, again, widens the pool of potential patients very considerably. So I think the patients on the maximum dose, at that place it was 200 milligrams, are a good place to start. But I think that's not, those aren't the only people at risk for overdose. And in fact, those are probably the most tolerant of all our patients. I had a patient whose daughter accidentally overdosed on her meds, on the mom's meds. So I'm wondering, shouldn't we be offering it more broadly? So this is a provider who really felt like household members needed to be involved. Patients really didn't perceive themselves at substantial risk for overdose. Many patients had been on medications for a very long time. They did not think they were at risk. And yet, they still endorsed having multiple potential risk factors, engaging in risk behavior, and having prior events that sounded like oh, adverse events from opioids that they did not disclose to their providers. Um, they also felt a sense of security if they took the medication as prescribed and for pain, that it couldn't happen if you took it as prescribed. And they thought other people were at much higher risk than they were. Like, of course, these other people are at risk, but I'm not. And then they really thought that risk was tied to abuse, not necessarily a known potential adverse event of a medication. So um, when the interviewer asked the patient if they thought it would be helpful to have a drug like naloxone around, um, the respondent said, I've never overdosed in my life. I'm 54 years old, and I don't think I'm going to start now. Um, uh, for another patient, the interviewer said, do you think it would be helpful to have it for yourself? No. Do you think naloxone would be helpful for you to have around? No. Why is that? Because I don't need it. And the same patient says, a little later in the interviews, well, at one point, I was taking a good chunk of morphine during the day, and well, to be honest with you, I burnt all kinds of hold in, holes in the carpet from smoking cigarettes, and I'd go like this. The patient starts to nod off. Nodding off or, yeah. You know, and that was when I was taking too much. 
So the same patient who felt like naloxone was not for them and said no actually described an over-sedation event that led them to actually burn holes in their carpets from dropped cigarettes and not off. Um, so there's just, there was just a disconnect between those two concepts. And then another patient said, I know that people have died. People die. Yeah, it's serious. But I also think that either they had mixed their pills, you know, and got confused, or some people really just out abused them and was trying to get a high or something and abused them or were seriously trying to kill themselves and did it. That's the way I see that. But I think if you take them as prescribed, you're okay. So there was a very strong sense of security in taking them as prescribed. You could understand that they were taking them as need to be a little bit more forthcoming about what they're doing and 
need to let a patient know that there will be no consequences, you know, because I can just hear them now. You know, UOD, we told you this was going to happen. You had to use this, whatever this drug is, and then all the repercussions coming from it. I can just hear it all now, and I wouldn't be very forthcoming about it. So um, this patient was just tremendously distrustful. And what's interesting is, you know, in our um, subsequent work, we really can't guarantee to patients that there are no consequences, because providers will probably taper them or taper their dose. So this is a very, very difficult barrier to address. Um, so this is what we asked about the trust. The respondent said, fear, oh, and what gets in the way of trust and communication with the doctor? I fear that he's going to take my medicine away and I'm going to be in pain. I'm not going to be high. With me, it's I'm going to be in pain. There's a lot of people, it's I'm going to not going to be getting high anymore. So this patient was very worried that the medication would be taken away from them if they accepted it all. So, and that's really the key difference between the clinical setting, community-based settings, because community-based settings, the, these community-based programs are not going to take the heroin away when patients come in and they find out that they're taking naloxone. Here, the physicians might actually respond poorly to the naloxone, um, to patients taking naloxone. Um, so I'm going to skip this last one, but this is just basically that um, patients, providers wanted guidelines, patients, um, had very clear things about how they wanted discussions about naloxone frame. They wanted to be a worst case scenario or just in case. They wanted to make sure we disconnected the naloxone from any fears about opioid misuse. And they thought that the training and the education about opioid overdose was valuable as actually getting the drug. They didn't think they were going to use the drug, but they thought the training and the education were really important. And they wanted disclosure of what would happen if they did have an overdose. So the patient says, if I had not heard what your description of naloxone was, I would probably almost be offended or something. I might be like, you think I'm abusing them and medications. I think the training would be as important as making the drug available. So, um, so in conclusion from this, you know, while they understood potential benefits, the providers had a few things that they really needed evidence on to uptake this practice. You know, is it effective in my population of patients? Are there guidelines? Guidelines, of course, need evidence. We don't have a lot of evidence. Who do I prescribe it to? Is this going to increase risk behavior or actually make opioids safer? And might my patients have an adverse effect from the medication? The patients um, were pretty mixed about naloxone. I was expecting much more enthusiasm, but they were actually mixed in our two settings, or three settings. They wanted transparency. They were also worried about adverse events. Um, they want. They didn't have much perception of risk themselves. They thought they didn't want to be associated with people who abuse drugs, and they wanted clear communication about disclosures of risk, what would happen to them. And so I think in the end, we really concluded that this is such a contentious and difficult topic in the primary care relationship because of inherent conflict of interest to full disclosure between the patient and the provider, that there may need to be some alternative approaches to distribution of naloxone in the healthcare setting. Um, so we have designed a trial to try to address some of this, um, and I'll just walk you through it in the last couple of minutes. This is a pragmatic, randomized trial of patients who prescribed chronic opioid therapy. We were really trying to answer these questions that patients and provider had. And our questions, our research questions are really to expanded access to naloxone in the healthcare system, um, lead to increased uptake, increased knowledge about overdose and naloxone, any changes in risk behavior, either worsening of risk behaviors or improving risk behaviors, and then changes in non-fatal overdose rates, changes in fatal overdose rates. And it is theoretically possible that you actually do have risk compensation, and yet the which I doubt, but it's possible. And people do engage in more risk behavior, and you might even have an increase in non-fatal overdoses, but a decrease in fatalities, because this medication prevents death. So I don't think that's going to happen, but that's a potential possibility. So the sum effect may still be beneficial, even if there's an increase in risk behavior. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so um, we have two components to this intervention. One is going to be pharmacy co-dispensing, so we're actually basically going around the primary care providers. Um, and this is supported by our state law that allows for standing 
orders, which means a pharmacist can dispense the medication without a prescription. And so the pharmacists are going to identify patients for naloxone, they're going to offer the naloxone to the patients when they pick up their opioids because they have to come in every month to get them. They'll dispense the naloxone to those who agree and they'll provide verbal and written education. It'll be very brief though. So we're not really sure if patients can fully absorb that information. Because that education has to happen at the pharmacy counter, very busy pharmacists with long lines. Um, so we don't know how quite how that's going to work out. <clears throat> so the other intervention we're testing is called our Naloxone Navigator. It's basically a web-based educational modular, sort of cartoony um, education that is based on the language suggested by our qualitative interviewers and the scenarios, vignettes that they share with us. It's 12 minutes, they'll be emailed, they can view this before, they go pick up their um, prescriptions, they can share the video with their family members, and it explains what's an overdose, what's naloxone, how do you prevent it, and how do you respond. Um, and so our hope is that this sort of prepares patients for the potential offer of naloxone, so they're more likely to accept it. So we have two levels of randomization, one is to the board. All the pharmacies want to do this, but where they can't all do it at the same time because there's a lot of other things going on in all these pharmacies. It's in two different health systems. And so they're going to be randomized to the order of implementation. And then the patients within those pharmacies will be randomized to get or not get the naloxone navigator. And then we're going to do some adverse event monitoring throughout the whole, the whole time period. So this is the design of the trial. All of our outcomes are outcomes that were raised by physicians and patients in the qualitative interviews, and uh, this is overly ambitious, I'm sure we will achieve this, but we have 28 pharmacies that we're hoping to um, randomize, and we're hoping to try to reach, since this is only electronic outreach, 2,000 patients, but through the emails that they have in the electronic health records. So, I guess just to wrap up, um, our goal was really to translate community-based <coughs> strategies into the health system to address overdose risk in very large populations. We did a lot of formative work to guide each part of this trial, and um, we are going to be doing some further adaptations because this really is a pragmatic trial in two very different health systems. And one of the things that we've learned is that patient populations are so different, there's issues with health literacy, or literacy in general and health literacy and even um, email access, internet access, and there's populations that we're constantly modifying our intervention to test it in both settings. Um, and of course, we're working with operational leaders who are not really interested in the research necessarily that we do at all. Like, they have no interest in it. And in fact, we're sort of a holding them, like we're making them do potentially a little bit more work. And so um, our trial design has already undergone several as a result of just trying to implement this in real world practice. So, um, there are a lot of other challenges in the field, and maybe in the roundtable discussions we can have some of these conversations, but there's a lot of issues about how to reduce exposure to opioids without increasing the risk of harm, how to monitor patients without leading to disengagement and distrust, um, how to engage and retain patients in evidence-based care, I think I have a lot of questions about how to use criminal justice sanctions in potentially more positive ways um, or to minimize the use of criminal justice sanctions. In practice, I have also a lot of questions about how to answer questions about this complex issue that comes up a lot in practice too, with families and patients. So, um, and then just to end, I'd like to thank, I, there's a ton of people who work on this project and uh, I just want to thank my, especially my, uh, multiple PI on this project, Jason Glantz, who's an epidemiologist um, that I work with at Kaiser. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry I didn't leave much time. Yes. Um, on the issue of stigma, yes, and, and the fact that people who end up opioid dependent Frequently, most of the time, have started out with prescription opioids and then moved along the continuum where they became dependent and then possibly shift to heroin because they can't get the prescriptions anymore or whatever. How do you deal with that whole 
thing of legitimacy. I mean, a person can be, you know, indeed, in reality, addicted, uh, who started out and, and because, uh, especially when you show the degree to which people don't know or understand the risk and are, are, are hedging about even talking about it because they know there's a stigma attached. So what approach do you take to that? You just I mean, my personal approach is that we should try to avoid uh, perpetuating the stigma by trying to pretend that we can sort of, that they're inherent. I mean, and I'm sure there are some inherent differences, but I think we have to be careful not to sort of perpetuate right. the stigma. So I think, you know, I guess in my practice, I try to normalize the whole spectrum of involvement with opioids. Um, and so that I, so that there's not, so you don't try to make distinctions. I mean, you know, there's a spectrum and it's, it's also a trajectory. And so you don't really know where somebody is in the trajectory. Right. Somebody might have no aberrant behaviors whatsoever, but yet still develop opioid use disorder 10 years down the line. So um, you really don't know where people are necessarily in the trajectory. So I guess I, you know, my hope is that everybody gets treated sort of the same way, in that there's some risk. We don't know how much it is in your particular case. We need to at least inform you of the risk. And at the same time, people who have opioid use disorder need compassion and empathy treated like every other patient in the same respectful way. So, I mean, that's sort of the best. And then from a policy perspective, I think we have to be really careful not to artificially demonize people who use heroin compared to people who use pills, because that's really false. And that's also potentially very um, related to a whole bunch of other disparities. We have to be very careful about who we sort of demonize in this. So, I don't know if that, that doesn't really answer your question. Yes. Uh, can I ask you, in one of your first slides, you were showing the different delivery methods um, for Narcan or Narcan, and you yeah. brought up, you know, physicians and healthcare providers or heroin users. I'm in the criminal justice field, and as you know, police who have not signed on for a career in, um, in health services very often are the first responders who are administering Narcan. How do you see police and the medical profession um, co-creating problem solving within this space? I have not seen very much interaction between police and the medical profession in this area. Um, I guess, I mean, I can only take sort of my local example. You know, we have something called the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention, and, call, and we do have some criminal justice stakeholders that are engaged, loosely engaged in that consortium. Um, so there is some conversation that's prior, and we have physician and public health people involved in pharmacy and a lot of other and advocates, harm reduction folks. So there is some discussion, I guess, through that formal format of a organized statewide consortium that's sort of under the Attorney General and Governor's office. Um, so there's some conversation there. I would say I, I know some of my one of my physician colleagues has been training delivered a lot so I guess it's not true that there's not a conversation. He's been going up ahead of our harm reduction coalition to train police around the state. Um, so so I guess there is some interaction, but I, there's not a lot of mechanisms by which police and physicians interact except for maybe in the emergency department setting. Which is a shame because a they both both feel I mean criminology, you yeah. have to guess. But um, both both fields could really inform, I think. Yeah, the situation I guess paramedics, in paramedics and ER personnel interact yeah. in a professional manner a lot. I don't know how much they interact around this particular topic. So, but there's probably room for more, more dialogue. Yes. Oh, you mentioned that it co that the program costs about 150 dollars. Is that the, the cost of patients, or is that? Um, I mean, is there a copay? Yeah, no. yeah there's a copay. So that's the cost of the medication. Rough, I mean, I don't know exactly, and it depends obviously yeah. where you are in contracts and all that stuff. That's the cost of the medication itself. Patients pay their standard brand copay, which could be $10 or $20 or $30. It depends on the plan you have. And if they have Medicaid, it might be just $1. But Medicaid actually doesn't cover that. They have to go to an outside pharmacy and get um, the intranasal kit. 
And how, how does the reimbursement work if if I was to, if, if I was not the one who was having this use disorder, but I was picking it up for a family member? Yeah, so we've just so how do they this, if the family member is a Kaiser member, for example, we'll just we'll just give it to them. We'll first we'll give it to them under the standing order. That's our that's the policy we've come to. Um, they do get a diagnostic code. So it does end up because you have to have a code associated with every prescription. Um, it's and it's a code that's like a counseling type of code or social problems or there's some kind of a counseling code that we can use to allow us to give it to a family member. And does it cost more in that scenario? Or is no, it the it's same? The same. It's the same. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hey, um, so I was recently part of a small group that was working on um, opioid overdose in the city, and one of the things that we talked about was co-prescribing naloxone with any opioid mm -hmm. prescription. And so I'm really interested in your just-in-case trial, and in particular, why you guys selected more of an opt-in versus opt-out model, and what were the other the drivers of that decision besides cost? Oh, actually, it is an opt, opt, let's see, opt-out model. So you have to say, no, I don't want it, as opposed to... Like the everyone idea is okay. the pharmacist will offer it to everybody. They, they can't offer it to everybody if they're really busy. So they they and they're and they're trying to figure out there's there's no real way of tracking who they've offered it to, and so we are conscious that we don't want to offer it every single time somebody comes in from the opiate because they've already declined it. So what they're probably going to do is over a three month period they're going to try to touch all of the patients on chronic opioids at least once, maybe up to three times. But we're trying to avoid them constantly making the offer with every opioid prescription because that's going to get very old, um, especially if the patient has said no or already picked it up. Mm -hmm. But it is an opt-out, I guess, in the sense that the patient doesn't have to initiate it. Right. Under a standing order, the patient has to initiate. We already have a standing order, and basically no one has gone and requested an alongside except for our research team members just to test out the standing order. So, um, so the standing order by itself doesn't do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about this active offer. Yeah. Yes. So I wanted to say, as a, uh, someone who's on the board of health, you know, in, in the past year there were 900 deaths due to opioid. I mean, we recently went up to five deaths a day, um, just to, to put a number on it. As someone who I, I feel like an antique who was involved in the early time of the AIDS epidemic, while not communicable per se, there's so much in common and so many lessons that could be cross fertilizing the fields here in terms of morality and stigma, because you notice that when someone gets a prescription for pain, um, that, that they're not doing it to themselves. This is, they're getting a prescription, they have a source of pain, this may or may not become for them a step to continue to take pills beyond what's prescribed, now they're at fault, and they're bound because they're at fault to get less. It's just, it's the pattern of everything that we do, and, and similar to the they did it to themselves mentality that prevented us from using really good public health tools for over a decade. Um, and, and I'm hoping the same thing doesn't happen here. And just to say, the majority of the deaths daily that happen in our city are from fentanyl lacing heroin. And so while all of this great stuff's happening, I'm a physician, I'm registered, most of the interventions are on patients with prescriptions, right? right? Because we can find them. But they are ultimately different at a different stage in addiction. Mm -hmm. um, than folks where we can't seem to find this fentanyl lacing and where it's coming in. So much work is being done, but there's been no stopping. So for the first time, that's comment from the public health perspective, we're not upstream. We are not upstream. And this is great, yeah. but it's downstream, amazingly so, um, in, in a lot of respects. So I, I, and there I, probably I, is a lot. I mean, you raised the issue of social. I think you can probably speak to this better, but I think there is a lot of social networks, also play family networks. Yep. That relate to this epidemic. So it's not contagious, but I think that there is a lot of community, family, social networks. There is, but so you know, there, there's an underlying racial component, and you don't say it, and you got to it on the illegitimate. Legitimate, I think a lot of people in here know that, that it became more white. And when it did, because of you were prescribing, then the concern was elevated. Right. So and there's a lot, you know, that's, that's a shame. shame. I'm glad we're here. Yeah. I think you and I would agree on this, that this is not unusual for these kinds of they did it to themselves phenomena. Yeah, and many of the same concerns that we have to address about risk compensation and all of that, I mean, right. um, are because there's always concerns about some of the effective interventions leading to more risk behavior in any of those kinds of public health problems, HIV, contraception, 
pressures, so self-choice. It's a recurring, recurring issues. Yes. Is there education for physicians and patients on managing chronic pain without the use of opioids, like using other options first before giving somebody an opioid yeah. for long-term use? Like we have much uh, more coherent guidelines now about everything that should be offered prior to an opioid um, <coughs> than we used to. And like in Kaiser, we have an integrated pain service that's really trying to use all of the non-opioid modalities to manage people's pain. With or without opioids. So, but that stuff, I mean, I think we have a pain management specialist here, like, that stuff is hard, it takes a lot of time, it takes a multidisciplinary team, it's expensive, it takes a lot of face to face contact, it's not easy, physical therapy, um, none of that stuff is sort of a magic bullet. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of effective interventions that are under Yes? Um, is there any, the survey that you did early with earlier in like was it 2013-14? Is there any plan to resurvey and see if attitudes have adjusted over time as the you know, awareness levels have gone up? Particularly, yeah. not only awareness levels but potentially data has also increased on you know, the questions that some of the physicians asked about whether or not there was efficacy of use in the field. And I feel like with a lot of EMS using this all yeah. the time every day, that there's more data there as well. Yeah, and I think the nice thing is, look, now I don't really feel like we have to do a survey because, or a qualitative interview, because we're going to see the data. So, like, yeah. I already know that there's been tremendous increases just in the last few months of naloxone prescribing by physicians. And so I can follow that in the electronic health record data based on claims. And so that pattern is very promising. And you're right, those interviews were done before that sort of rise in um, prescribing. It's still not a lot of prescribing, but it's definitely substantially increased. And then a follow-up to that was sure. the whether or not the electronic medical records, like if, I, if there's a, you know, based on the new data coming in, if that will allow for you to adjust and flag things to providers, in, you know, in the EMR that when someone is at the, at risk because they have the, the kind of mix of factors that you're seeing coming into your data, yeah. will that adjust over time, or is that something that you're currently using? Because I'm curious if it's something that could be rolled out beyond just your network. Yeah, with I mean, if we, data can, we built a val internally validated predictive model within Kaiser that we can now put into the electronic health record that could sort of prompt physicians to prescribe naloxone. Um, and we could test how that works out. We have to be very cautious with those tools because there's a lot of other potentially unintended consequences yes. of giving providers that information. So we're sort of trying to rethink that information and try to think about maybe that information is better targeted to the patients, maybe it's better, maybe there's other ways, or maybe it's okay for the providers, but it needs to be with very clear recommendations of what to do with the information. Um, so I think, I, so we're still sort of struggling with that. And so, yeah. Yes. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, oh there's, oh, there's one up here too. Oh, and so I guess two? Okay. Go ahead. Um, I know in the website you talked about that that has the, the family of the provider as well, um, or the family of the patient as well, but from the providers describing it, is there any like aim to have that patient then disseminate the information to their family or their spouse or people that yeah. are around them? So we um, designed an opioid safety clinic at one of the hospitals, at one of our clinics, um, where we bring in patients for face-to-face -face, um, discussions around all aspects of opioid safety, and we also try to fill in the guideline stuff, do all, check all the guideline boxes, and um, in that we try to encourage them to bring their family members to those visits so that they can get, I mean, but of course some people are very socially isolated, so we found that about half people don't actually have somebody to come with them, which is going to greatly reduce the effectiveness of the loss. So, there was one other question. A comment, because it's hard for us in public health to always keep in mind all of the unintended consequences, but there was actually, was this week in the New York Times op-ed page, an article by somebody, I don't know the name of the, remember the name of the person, but apparently the systems where they were using patient satisfaction as a guideline for physician payment has had an un unintended consequence in some instances, maybe more than we know, of having physicians increase opioid prescribing because 
when they when the patient came for a good pain medicine, they and they didn't get it, then they gave in bad satisfaction ratings. And I mean, it's really very perverse when we see something like that, but it's something we in public health, it's another whole level that we need to think about things. Yeah, I, that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming in and joining us for our Population Health Spotlight. Um, and I want to invite any students to join us afterwards and Connelly Clapper for a student council. So thank you so much.